Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Mount Everest is plagued with supernatural phenomena, ghost sightings, and other unexplained occurrences, and rescue missions on the mountain are considered suicidal. Stranded hikers are sometimes left exposed to the elements so long that they don't survive. The mountain is like an open graveyard. Corpses are constantly abandoned or frozen in the snow, so it's no wonder that ghost sightings on Mount Everest are inevitable. It would almost be weirder if there weren't any at all. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Some of the scary tales about Mount Everest are obviously fake, but some have a ring of truth. At such high altitudes, it's logical to explain some of these supernatural Mount Everest hauntings as simple hallucinations. A significant decrease in oxygen makes the brain conjure up some peculiar images. But what if there is some credence to these scary tales? What if something really is haunting the Himalayan mountain? Mount Everest is notorious for its corpses. People travel from all around the world to climb the Himalayan mountain, but not all of them survive the harsh conditions. There are avalanches, slippery slopes, and inclement temperatures that prove fatal. Unfortunately, many of the bodies continue to go unidentified. In fact, in 2017, four bodies were discovered in a tent on an Everest base camp analysts believed the campers passed away due to altitude sickness. The creepy kicker? None of the local climbing agencies reported any missing climbers. Pemba Dorja, a Sherpa from Nepal, confessed to spotting black shadows during his 2004 ascent of Mount Everest. He noted, "...when I paused at a mound of rocks, I saw some spirits in the form of black shadows coming towards me." stretching their hands and begging for something to eat. Dorje theorized that the shadows were perhaps spirits belonging to mountaineers killed during past climbs. His theory isn't too far-fetched, because it is sometimes tradition to leave a deceased climber's body on the mountain as a form of respect. While Mount Everest hosts hundreds of corpses, there is one corpse in particular that everybody seems to talk about. The deceased man is known as Green Boots. The body is now a landmark on the main northeast ridge route of the mountain. In death, Green Boots has become a guide for the living. Creepily enough, passing climbers occasionally pose with the body and take pictures with it, and David Sharp, a fellow mountaineer, famously died of hypothermia right next to Green Boots' body. 
Mohan Singh, a resident of Bemni, a local Himalayan village, reportedly encountered a strange man outside his home one day while chopping wood during the winter months of 2009. The sky turned black, and the stranger demanded to know why Singh was cutting the trees. Then he reached for Singh's shirt, but the stranger's fingers went right through Singh's body, just like a ghost's fingers might do. Also, throughout the altercation, the stranger's body continuously changed sizes, growing up to nine feet tall, then suddenly shrinking to the height of a chicken. Baba Harbaja Singh, no relation to Mohan Singh I just told you about, was an Indian army soldier known as the Hero of Natula. He passed away in 1968 after slipping into a stream while escorting a mule in the Himalayas. His body was eventually recovered by a search party supposedly led by his own ghost. Singh entered soldiers' dreams and informed them of his death. He would also randomly appear on horseback, guiding the search party to his own body. Some people say that Singh's ghost still protects India's border against any impending attacks. After escaping the strange man, Singh found himself with an intense fever. He believed the only way to resolve the fever was to slaughter a goat during a special exorcism ceremony arranged by a Hindu priest. In June 1933, Frank Smith suddenly sensed he wasn't alone as he descended from one of Mount Everest's notorious death zones. During a break from the arduous journey, he encountered the presence of a man. Smith divided his mint cake and attempted to share half of it with a phantom companion. Some time later, Smith discovered two dark, bulbous objects hovering above him. He described one of the objects as having squat, underdeveloped wings, while the other possessed a beak-like protuberance like the spout of a tea kettle. The inexplicable objects remained pulsating over him until eventually disappearing in a passing mist. Arguably, the best evidence of real yetis actually comes from photographs of numerous large footprints found in snow on Mount Everest. Some of the photos were snapped by Himalayan mountaineer Eric Shipton, and he shared it was one of the glaciers of the Menlong Basin at a height of about 19,000 feet that, late one afternoon, we came across those curious footprints in the snow. We did not follow them further than was convenient, a mile or so, for we were carrying heavy loads at the time, and besides, we had reached a particularly interesting stage in the exploration of the basin. These particular ones seemed to be very fresh, probably not more than 24 hours old. We had no doubt whatsoever that the creatures, for there had been at least two that had made the tracks, were yetis, or wild men. In 1975, Dougal Haston and Doug Scott claimed to sense a third climber aiding their survival during one particularly brutal night on Mount Everest. Haston and Scott were members of the first expedition that successfully climbed Mount Everest using an uncharted path. Their hiking method utilized finger holds, edges, and smears rather than normal crack climbing. The ghostly mountaineer that the men encountered apparently provided extra company and encouragement. Haston and Scott claimed that the Phantom Climber helped them make it through the night alive. When Weird Darkness returns, are there living dinosaurs in the lakes of Connemara in Ireland? That story is up next. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, 
as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Recently, Conspiracy Journal ran an article, The Hunt for the Giant Horse-Headed Eel Begins Soon in Ireland. That's right. The quest to try and solve the mystery of these massive Irish beasts will hopefully soon be underway. This is not just an Irish phenomenon, though. It should be noted that a number of witnesses to the Loch Ness Monsters of Scotland said that what they encountered also looked like giant eels. We'll begin with a classic story, and a controversial one, from January 1934. On this occasion, the witness was a man named Arthur Grant of Glen Urquhart, Scotland. The Grant was a student veterinarian added to the weight and credibility of his report. A keen motorcyclist, 21-year-old Grant was on the roads, heading home at around 1 a.m., when he very nearly became the first person to ever have a head-on collision with a Nessie. Fortunately, however, neither monster nor motorcycle were injured. That the night sky was dominated by a powerful, eerie moon meant that Grant had a very good view of the beast, as it loomed before him, caught in the glare of his motorbike's headlight. It was at a distance of around 120 feet that Grant caught sight of something unusual in front of him. Exactly how unusual became immediately apparent. Grant said of his sighting that he was practically on top of the monster when its tiny head, sat atop an elongated neck, suddenly turned in his direction. Evidently just as shocked as Grant was, the monster made two bounds across the road, headed down to the lock, and vanished into the depths with an almighty splash. Grant brought his motorcycle to what was literally a screeching halt, and demonstrating his spirited character, gave chase. It was quickly clear to Grant, however, that as a result of the huge splash, the monster had made good its escape. Nevertheless, in the time between it was first seen and when it fled for the dark waters, Grant was able to get an excellent view of his quarry. He described the monster as having a bulky body, flippers rather than legs, and an approximately six-foot-long thick tail that looked like it could inflict significant damage. As for its overall size, Grant suggested somewhere close to 20 feet. Skeptics claim that Grant fabricated the story. However, it should be noted that he was insistent that he saw a monster and even made a statement to that effect to the Edinburgh-based Veterinary Society. Given that Grant was a student veterinarian, it seems unlikely that he would have taken the risk of recklessly lying to the Veterinary Society. A prank on the press is one thing, Risking one's entire future career in front of the society would have been quite another entirely. Grant's statement is an important one, as it adds some additional intriguing data to his original report. As he said, given his profession, he knew more than a bit about the world of natural history. As a result, he had pondered deeply on the nature of the monster. Interestingly, Grant said that the beast seemed to be a chimera, that's to say a combination of several creatures. The head of the monster, explained Grant, was eel-like. Moving on to the 21st century, on May 26, 2007, a man named Gordon Holmes filmed, well, something in Loch Ness. It was something that turned Holmes into an overnight media sensation, albeit a brief sensation. The day in question was dominated by heavy rain, 
but which cleared as the evening arrived, allowing Holmes to get clear footage of what looked like some kind of animal moving at a significant rate of knots in the waters of Loch Ness. The specific location from where all the action was captured was a parking area on the A82 road just a couple of miles from Drumna Docket. Not only that, Holmes estimated as he excitedly watched and filmed that the creature was around 14 meters in length, which if true effectively ruled out everything known to live in the inland waters of the British Isles. Holmes, a lab technician, caught the attention of not just the British media but also the likes of NBC News and CNN. He and his near-priceless film were quickly big news. Holmes said when the media descended upon him in absolute droves that he could scarcely believe what he was seeing. His first thought was giant eel. Holmes told the media of the eel theory, they have serpent-like features and they may explain all the sightings in Loch Ness over the years. On September 17, 2009, John Downs of the UK-based Center for Fortean Zoology, his wife Karina, and CFZ colleague Max Blake took a trip to Ireland's Lowlean. It was during the course of the expedition that the team encountered something incredible. As Karina notes, something very strange appeared before them. I saw a trail left by something as it made its way from the island to the shore to the east of it. I was to be pressed for an answer. I would probably suggest a large eel. Max Blake recorded his thoughts on the encounter, too. If I had to make a guess, I would say that it was most likely to have been a giant eel. In June 2015, a huge fish was spotted by two astonished and terrified anglers on the River Nain in the Fens, Cambridgeshire, England. One of the fishermen told BBC Radio Cambridgeshire that on the day when all hell broke loose, the two friends were boating in the direction of Whittlesey when their boat juddered, suggesting they had collided with something. But with what? They peered over the side of the boat and encountered something extraordinary – a huge creature, easily six feet in length and possibly even slightly bigger, was swimming by. While they weren't sure of the specific type of fish, there's no denying it was a definitive monster and hardly the kind of thing one would expect to see in the River Neen, or in any other stretch of English water. The two men speculated that what they had seen was a sturgeon. Not an impossibility, since sturgeon can grow to impressive sizes, but the catfish was also offered as a potential candidate. Then there was the theory of another witness, namely that the creature was not a catfish, but a giant eel. The witness was Michelle Cooper, who was prompted to come forward by the media publicity given to the June 2015 encounter. Her sighting, however, had occurred somewhere in the region of one year earlier. She said to the Cambridge News that some of her friends poked fun at her when she told them of her encounter with the mysterious Leviathan. But Michelle was sure that she saw something huge and daunting. Notably, while speaking with the media, she noted that when I researched what it could be, I found it looked exactly like the giant eels you get in America. I was really shaken up by it. Monster hunters are coming to Ireland this summer in search of this eel-like creature with a head like a horse. Cryptozoology is a subscience that aims to uncover creatures that are usually confined to folklore, and cryptozoologists from the U.S. and elsewhere are making plans to explore Irish lakes in search of mysterious creatures this coming August and make a documentary about their findings. Ireland has a rich history of these animals, and the documentary makers are planning to search the lakes of Connemara for the horse eel, or pistas as they are known. The fearsome eel is said to be about 30 feet long, with hair running along its spine. Richard Freeman is the head of the Fortean Center of Zoology in Devon in the UK and said this is the first time since the 1960s that this horse eel has been hunted for. This center is the only one of its kind in the world, and Richard, who is an ex-zookeeper, has been at the helm since founding it in 1992. He is providing support for the documentary Enigma that Travis Wolfe and Alison Jorlian intend to shoot later this year. He told the Irish Mirror the last proper investigations were carried out by Captain Lionel Leslie and author F.W. Holliday in the late 1960s. 
Captain Leslie used dynamite to force the creatures to the surface. He reported seeing one thrashing about at the surface after a blast had been set off. The creatures reported from the Lowe's are known locally as horse eels or pistas. They're said to resemble eels with a horse-like mane running along the back. They range from 10 to 30 feet long and are capable of crawling across the land. The most famous sighting occurred in 1954 at Lofada when Georgina Carberry, a librarian from Clifton and her friends, saw a 30-foot eel-like beast with jaws like a shark. The creature she described as wormy terrified her so much she had nightmares for years and would never return to the low alone or at night. However, Richard said this new study is particularly important because the monsters may just be a massive strain of eel. He said the monsters may be a gigantic mutant strain of the common eel. The European eels live in fresh water, but when it's ready to breed, it swims out into the Sargasso Sea. The eels breed and die here, and the young swim back to the waters inhabited by their ancestors. However, there is a theory that some eels never sexually develop. These eunuch eels, as they're known, remain in fresh water, and nobody knows just how long they live or how big they get. It's believed that these mutations are, on occasion, within a normal population of eels. The Enigma documentary aims to uncover what's really in these lakes, using state-of-the-art equipment and to document their findings. Richard said that if we can understand what causes such growth in eels, we may be able to understand animal growth in general much better. When asked about the skepticism that surrounds cryptozoology, Richard said that he doesn't pay any notice to it. He said, I stopped caring about what mainstream science thinks a long time ago. The giant squid, the mountain gorilla, the Komodo dragon, and the okapi were all dismissed as myths before they were discovered. Large animals are still being discovered today. The great days of zoology are not done. For generations, the farmers and fishermen of Connemara have spoke of strange creatures that dwelt within the surrounding bog waters. They were addressed by different names, and though somewhat elusive, they were quite real. Children were often warned to avoid certain lakes, and even peat harvesters knew better than to work near shore during the evening. On a June day in 1954, Georgina Carberry and three friends biked down to Lofada, they unlocked a boat owned by the Clifton Angling Association and set out upon it with their fishing gear. By late in the afternoon, they had succeeded in securing a number of trout. The group decided to set the boat ashore along a finger of land that almost splits the lake in half. As they were settling down with their tea, one of them pointed out an object moving from an island, the island, which she assumed was a man swimming soon it became apparent that it was too big to be human. The mysterious object was approaching them at a very leisurely pace. When it reached within 20 yards distance, Georgina made the first move and jumped back. The others took cue and likewise got some distance from the water. As soon as they'd moved, the thing swung right around a rock near the shore and dove. In less than two minutes, it had gone practically up to the island again, where it reappeared. When the creature came close to the group on shore, it opened its huge, great mouth. Two big humps were noticed sticking above the water behind its head. Georgina said she spotted a forked tail when it swung around the rock. The interior of its mouth was white, and Georgina likened it to a shark's mouth. Georgina described the animal's skin as wormy or creepy, as it seemed to have motion throughout its body at all times. Georgina claimed to have reoccurring nightmares afterwards and avoided the lake for a good six or seven years. Even then, she wouldn't go alone. One of the other witnesses to this day begs her family not to go near Lofada. On February 22, 1968, farmer and marble quarry worker Stephen Coyne set off to gather dry peat near Lonahuan with his eldest and the family dog. As he approached the peat bed, Stephen spotted a black object amongst a patch of reeds within the lake, assuming it was the dog he whistled for, but the dog appeared running along the shore. While en route, it noticed the figure in the water and began barking. 
Stephen could see it was some sort of large animal with a black head that was rounded like a kettle and fused upon a neck an estimated nine inch to a foot in diameter. The skin was black, hairless and slick-looking, very much like an eel's. The creature began swimming around the small low until it apparently became annoyed at the dog's continual barking. With an open mouth, it began homing in on the canine's position. However, when Stephen arrived at his dog's side for support, it retreated and resumed its aimless swim around the low. Whenever it would duck its head underwater, two humps would come into view. A flat tail was also seen on occasion, and in one instance was even extended up towards the head. Stephen sent his son home to get a camera. Unfortunately, there was no film, but when the boy returned with his mother and additional siblings making a total of seven at the scene, Mrs. Coyne proved to be the bravest of the bunch and drew closest to shore. Perhaps because of her vantage point, she would later note what appeared to be horns emitting from the animal's head, a feature unnoticed by Stephen or the children. Stephen thought the closest distance they had between the animal was nine yards, whereas Mrs. Coyne felt it was more like five yards. The creature kept swimming back and forth across the lake for the better part of an hour until finally the coins felt they'd seen enough and returned home. Apparently, the horse eel is not exclusively a water animal, as a man named Thomas Conley reported that one evening in September when he noticed a strange animal lingering on the shore of Lonahuan. The creature was rolling or crawling toward the water when Thomas first spotted it only 15 feet from the lake's edge. It was bigger than a mare's full and very long, with a width estimated at two to two and a half feet. Conley said the skin was commented on as being very black, and once it entered the water, it created spray on both sides and remained a few seconds before sinking. Whatever happens this August, perhaps we may finally soon have an answer to the important question, are many of our lake monsters actually gigantic eels? Up next, want to live on a cheap in Tokyo, Japan? It's easy to do if you don't mind living with a ghost or two. Plus, high school teacher Pamela Smart fell in love. Unfortunately, she fell in love with a 15-year-old student, which was not smart. And that's only the beginning of this horrible story. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Terror began in January by the light of the full moon. The first scream came from the snowbound railway man who felt the werewolf's fangs ripping at his throat. The next month, there was a scream of ecstatic agony from the woman attacked in her cozy bedroom. Now, scenes of unbelievable horror unfold each time the full moon shines on the isolated main town of Tarker's Mills. No one knows who will be attacked next. But one thing is sure, when the full moon rises, a paralyzing fear sweeps through Tarker's mills, for snarls that sound like human words can be heard whining through the wind, and all around are the footprints of a monster whose hunger cannot be sated. Cycle of the Werewolf by Stephen King Hear the entire novel absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com The neon-drenched, vast urban megapolis of Tokyo, Japan is one of the largest, most advanced, high-tech and modernized cities on the planet. It's truly a wonder to behold and offers all of the modern conveniences and razzle-dazzle one would expect from such a bustling metropolis. Yet, if you want to live here, you are in for a surprise. Land prices and rent here are through the roof with Tokyo consistently ranked as one of the most expensive cities to live 
not in just Japan but on the entire planet. Even staying in a hotel in a room the size of your closet back home can set you back hundreds of dollars a night in Tokyo, making living in your dream apartment in the city a rather expensive proposition and likely forever out of your reach. However, there is a way, and if you don't mind sharing a place with spirits and ghosts, you can get a really good deal. For such a modern and technologically advanced nation, the Japanese can be extremely superstitious, and this can even be seen in mega cities like Tokyo. One area where this superstition comes to the foray is in choosing a place to live, and one type of residence that is typically shunned are what are known as stigmatized properties, or jikobuken in Japanese, which are places that have some association with death and suffering. Such apartments or homes come in several levels of stigmatization. For instance, if a place is located next to a cemetery, this is seen as mildly stigmatized, or a bit more so if one can actually see the gravestones from the window. Higher up the totem pole are apartments or homes where there has been a death on the premises, such as a suicide, the death of a lone elderly tenant called a lonely death, or worse yet, a violent murder or deadly accident. Such places are incredibly difficult to rent out, and it's difficult for real estate companies to cover up such things, as Japanese law requires that landlords tell potential buyers or renters of any defects, violent incidents, or deaths that have happened there. Get a house or flat where there has been a violent death and it can be almost impossible to find a taker, as the Japanese believe that the very likely restless and even vengeful ghost will almost certainly linger there. Because of this aversion to these haunted, stigmatized locations, landlords are forced to drop the rent or prices of such homes considerably, with cuts of 30 to 50 percent or even more, depending on the severity of the place's dark past and the level of violence involved in the deaths. Murders are, of course, the worst, and one president of a Tokyo-based real estate company has said of these locations, Japanese people hate Jikobuken. It is a ghost problem. It's really the murders where the price needs to be cut in half. Those are the spirits that Japan fears the most. So profound is this aversion to living in a place tainted by death and possible ghosts that tenants at such properties can be stigmatized themselves, with friends or family avoiding them or imploring them to move out. To offset the stigma of death and potential spooks on properties, in addition to deep price cuts, there will often be purification ceremonies performed by priests at the property in order to appease any spirits and satisfy a potential buyer that the place is safe. But even then, it can be difficult to find a taker. So ingrained is this fear of angry ghosts. The author of this article continues by saying, I actually have experienced this in action when years ago I was shopping around for a place to rent not long after moving to Japan. I was apartment hunting and absolutely shocked by some of the exorbitant rents in Tokyo when I came across a listing for an anomalously cheap place near Shinjuku. If you don't know anything about Tokyo, Shinjuku is a bustling economic center and holds some of the most prime real estate in the entire city. It's also one of the most expensive places to live in an already expensive city, so when I found this place I was thinking that I had lucked out. I contacted the real estate agent who had been advertising the place and went out there to have a look. It was a bit of an older building, but the room looked fine, had obviously been fixed up, and I could not see any defects or particular reason why it should be so cheap. It's interesting to note that up until then there had been absolutely no mention of the apartment's grim past, but I was soon to find out. After I looked around the place and got all the specifics of it, I was just about sold. It seemed too good to be true, and that was when the guy showing me around sort of cleared his throat and gave me something akin to, oh, by the way, there's one more thing. It turned out there had been a death in that apartment, indeed in the very room we were standing in. The agent explained to me that there had been an elderly man who'd lived there, and he had fallen into a deep depression and apparently hanged himself there. Since the guy had no friends or family and had mostly kept to himself, the body had not even been discovered for several days, 
just dangling about on that cord in the shadows all alone. I can see how such knowledge can have a psychological effect on hauntings, because I immediately felt my hair stand up on end and I got a bit of a mild electric feel that pulsed through me. I suppose the guy saw my ashen face and reaction because he was quick to explain that the place had been renovated since then and that there had been a ceremony carried out there to cleanse it. I thanked him and went home. But I have to tell you, I still almost took it as it was an excellent location and was so cheap. Alas, everyone told me to forget about it and I chickened out, but yeah, I almost lived in a haunted apartment in Tokyo. This could all be a real headache for landlords and real estate agents, with the only saving grace being that they are only legally required to tell of these incidents to the first tenant after death. Unfortunately for them, making it all even worse for them and negating this loophole is the fact that there have been people who have actually compiled maps of the various supposedly haunted apartments and homes in Tokyo for all to see. One realtor named Tiru Oshima had taken it upon himself to painstakingly compile information through police and newspaper reports, tip-offs from fellow agents, testimony from former tenants, and his own research into the history of various properties in order to make a detailed online guide of properties where deaths and misfortune have occurred, which is made into a map that is offered for free online and which, in Wikipedia style, can be edited and expanded by contributors. For each stigmatized or supposedly haunted property, Oshima uses a system similar to the Michelin star system for restaurants, in this case awarding fire icons based on the gruesomeness of the death or deaths that have happened at the locations and the severity of the potential haunting. The higher the number of fire icons, up to a maximum of three, the more haunted and less desirable the property, and thus cheaper. For instance, an apartment where an elderly woman died in her sleep is listed as a one-icon residence. Another, where a man killed himself, is a two-icon place, and three-icon properties include an apartment where the tenant was stabbed to death by a home intruder, and another where a young couple was killed in a gas explosion at the home. Clicking on an icon will bring up specific information on the property, including, of course, macabre details on who died there and how. The free online map has gone on to become the bane of real estate agents and landlords all over Tokyo, but has been met with open arms for people looking for a bargain on a place to live. The meticulously crafted map is constantly updated, currently holds around 9,000 fire icons and is extremely popular with millions of views per day. Although there has been criticism that some of the information might not be accurate and that it is all rather macabre and in poor taste, Oshima does not plan to stop anytime soon, and indeed plans to branch out into other countries and eventually the whole world. He's already made some steps in this direction, with the fire icons for some properties in Los Angeles and around 80 fire icons in New York City such as a hotel overlooking Central Park where a dead body was found in a room on the 19th floor. It's interesting that there is so much fear of ghosts and the vestiges of death hanging over these places in such an advanced country, and that these locations should be so completely shunned. Despite the lack of religious leanings in many of the inhabitants of Tokyo, there is still that old superstition of the taint of death and the belief in ghosts is very much alive here. Yet it could just work out in your favor, if you're ever thinking about getting a place in Tokyo, and if you don't mind having a potentially ghostly roommate, you could very well snag yourself a pretty nice pad at a reasonable price. Nearly 30 years ago, on August 1, 1990, authorities in New Hampshire met with still-grieving widow Pamela Smart to deliver some good news and bad. The good news is we've solved the murder of your husband, they said. The bad news is you're under arrest. Just three months earlier, on May 1, 1990, the 22-year-old media coordinator at Winniconnet High School had come back home from work 
to find her 24-year-old husband Greg brutally murdered in their living room in what appeared to be a botched robbery. Police determined that Greg had been killed by a single gunshot wound to the head. Further analysis revealed the bullet was from a 38 caliber gun, but the ransacked state of the Smart home soon revealed itself to be a ruse. Pamela Smart was suspected of seducing one of her students and then convincing the student to murder her husband. The murder shocked the once quiet town of Derry, New Hampshire, and the ensuing trial captured headlines across the country. One of the first high-profile trials involving a teacher-student affair, the Smart case also made an impact on pop culture. Joyce Maynard's popular novel, To Die For, drew upon details from the Pamela Smart story, and later was adapted by Gus Van Sant into the 1992 film of the same name, starring Nicole Kidman. Maynard's seductive page-turner, the New York Times Book Review calls it that, follows a local weather reporter named Suzanne Moretto who yearns for superstardom. When her dreams fail to come true, she decides her unglamorous husband is to blame, so she seduces a 15-year-old admirer to permanently take care of her husband. Greg Smart was murdered on or around May 1, 1990. Pamela reportedly found the body after coming home from a meeting and soon reported it to the police. Pamela was noticeably chatty about the death of her husband. Five days after the violent death of her husband, she contacted Bill Spencer at WMUR News Channel 9 and offered the station an exclusive interview. Then, on May 14th, police received an anonymous phone call indicating a girl named Cecilia Pierce knew about the plan to murder Greg. Cecilia was a student intern of Mrs. Smart's at Winniconnet High School. Cecilia first met Pamela when she was assigned to work at the school's media center. The two developed a close friendship, and Cecilia began to spend the night at the Smart home. There, she discovered her outgoing teacher possessed a very dark secret. Pamela was in love with a 15-year-old boy named Billy Flynn. The amorous instructor believed she could successfully keep the affair under wraps. Unfortunately for her, though in no way surprising, Billy was far less tight-lipped. Billy bragged about his love life to his buddies. Vance Latham Jr., Patrick Randall, and Raymond Fowler, they all knew about the affair. The gang was known as troublemakers around Derry. When Billy suggested they rob a house, the others went along with it, not realizing who they were going to target. Greg Smart, the one man standing in Billy's way. On May 1st, the gang drove to the Smart's condo. Vance and Raymond waited in a plaza behind the condo while Billy and Patrick went inside. Approximately 90 minutes later, the two returned to the car visibly shaken. On the ride home, Billy and Patrick admitted to killing Greg Smart. Patrick said he held the man down with a knife to his throat while Billy shot him in the head. On June 11th, fresh off Cecilia's tip, police arrested Billy, Patrick, and Vance. Billy was charged with first-degree murder. Patrick and Vance were charged with being accomplices to the crime. It didn't take long for young Billy Flynn to confess to the killing, though he claimed the deadly act was justified. Greg had beaten Pamela, and Billy saw the bruises to prove it. A sensitive and protective boy, Billy merely wanted to save the woman he loved. For her, he was willing to kill. Bolstered by Billy's confession, the police zeroed in on Pamela Smart. First, they tapped her phone line. Then they convinced Cecilia to wear a wire and get Pamela talking about the murder. On July 13th, police obtained a recording between the two friends that implicated Pamela in the murder of her own husband. On August 1st, she was arrested in her office at Winniconnet High School, and WMUR News caught the entire thing on tape. Before the trial even found a jury, the case became a media sensation. The image of the young, grieving widow now on trial for the death of her own husband captivated the nation. Beginning March 4, 1991, the trial was televised live every day, the first to air on court TV. Facing first-degree murder charges, Pamela would receive life in prison if convicted. All four boys, Raymond had been arrested during the pre-trial hearing, had secured plea bargains before the trial began, and the prosecution used their testimonies 
to portray Pamela as a woman intent on murder. Pamela admitted to the affair with Billy, but claimed she was innocent of the murder. She claimed her husband was also sleeping around and she had wanted to repair the relationship. When she tried to end things with Billy, he flew into a jealous rage. Cecilia testified to the contrary, though, claiming that two months before the murder, Pamela confessed she was madly in love with Billy. The jury sided with the prosecution. Pamela wanted to avoid expensive divorce fees and profit from Greg's $140,000 life insurance policy. On March 22, 1991, Pamela was found guilty of being an accomplice to first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and witness tampering. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. All four boys served their sentences and were released. Billy was the last to be granted parole in March 2015, 25 years after the murder. In 2014, HBO aired a documentary, Captivated, featuring interviews with Pamela Smart, who maintains her innocence to this day. In May 2019, nearly 30 years after the shocking trial, Pamela Smart was denied a sentence reduction hearing by the New Hampshire Executive Council. Smart's failed request marked the second time she has asked the state council for a hearing, thus exhausting all of her appeal options. In a jailhouse interview with WBZ's Paula Eben, Smart called the decision completely unfair. When Weird Darkness returns, weirdo family member Josh Marinkovic tells of an eerie true experience that would shake anyone to the core. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. This story comes from weirdo family member Josh Marinkovic. He said, my whole life I've been able to see spirits or feel a presence from time to time. My mom attributes it to the fact that I almost died while she was giving birth to me. I literally had one more minute, a single minute to live, or else they couldn't save me. We all believe that I got some sort of gift, sixth sense, or sometimes I think it's a curse. I have had many horrifying experiences in my 31 years, most recently, it happened October 1st, 2018. My buddy that I grew up with, that had moved a few hours away from me, came home to spend the night at my place and visit. My brother, who this story revolves around, was at work all evening. He came home around 9.30 to shower and get ready because his friend from work it was their birthday and they were going out for the night. He told me that he would be back sometime in the evening the following day. He left my friend and I stayed up a bit longer, then decided we should hit the hay because I had to work the next morning and he had a four-hour drive ahead of him. The next morning, October 2nd, my alarm went off at 5 a.m. for work. I got up and realized that my work clothes were downstairs in the dryer. I went down to get them and realized I had to use the restroom. My brother's bedroom's located in the basement as well, and in order to get to the bathroom downstairs, you have to walk through his room. I pulled the curtain over, which separates his room from the rest of the finished basement, and there was Tim, my buddy, sleeping on my brother's couch. When you first walk into his room, his headboard's right there, to the right. 
I looked over it and saw that my brother was in bed sleeping. Covers pulled up to his neck, fast asleep on his side. I thought, huh, interesting. He must have made it home late last night. I went to the restroom and came back out and I looked at my little brother sleeping away once more. I got ready and left out the front door. Noting that my car and my mom's were the only ones out front of our house, I thought to myself that he must have parked on the side of the house in front of the garage. I got in my car and turned down my alley and then I saw it. My brother's car was not parked on the side in front of the garage. I parked my car immediately, ran back inside, down the stairs, threw open his curtain and looked in his bed. He wasn't there. The bed was empty. In the first year of living in her peaceful house in Guilford, Ontario, Jody never noticed anything unusual. Then, one warm, sunny day while working in her sewing room, Jody found herself distracted by children's laughter in her backyard. She made her way to the window, and there she watched two young kids playing joyfully with each other. She smiled at the youthful antics as she reminisced about her own childhood but the smile upon her face faded as she began to notice that something wasn't quite right. I suddenly realized they weren't local kids because they were dressed in period clothes, clothes from a hundred years ago, Jody remembers. The little girl wore a dress with a petticoat underneath, a pretty ribbon on her hair, and shoes that weren't from our era. The boy had short pants with an old-fashioned plaid shirt and suspenders. Jody stood frozen at the window and just watched the strange sight before her eyes. The children continued to play as if they hadn't a care in the world. Jody didn't dare move, afraid that if she did, the children would notice her and disappear. The one thing that sticks out in Jody's memory is how real the children looked. They weren't translucent or misty. You couldn't see through them. It was just like two flesh-and-blood kids stepped out of the past to play in my yard. Their visits became frequent through the years. Jody could never understand why they had chosen her backyard as their personal playground. She herself didn't have any children, so no playing equipment or toys could be found on her yard, and yet it was there that she would always see them. In recent years, the visitations have become less frequent and Jody has begun to miss them. I was never scared of the ghosts, she says, somewhat wistfully. It's actually scarier when you don't see them than when you do. You begin to wonder what happened to them, to worry as if they were real children. Who were these children? What were their names? What tragedy cut their lives short? We'll probably never know. There are some hints, however. The clothes Jody describes definitely sound Victorian, corresponding to the late 19th century. This was a period when simple childhood illnesses, influenza, smallpox, and measles could and would frequently rampage through a household claiming the small and weak one after another. It's possible that the young boy and girl were siblings who were tragically struck down by the same illness. The untimely nature of their deaths tied them here, where they continue to play out their childhoods in a familiar environment. In light of how close Jody's property is to Lake Simcoe, it's also possible that the waters might have claimed their lives. Certainly that's the fate one sensitive saw for them. For Jody, it didn't matter who they were or where they came from. Having them play in her backyard was something she actually looked forward to, Their less frequent visitations could be a sign that the children are growing up, that they have now experienced their full childhood and are ready to cross over to the other side. We all have to grow up sometime, even ghosts. For Jody, the day they leave for good will be a sad time. Her life will feel emptier, her house quieter, and surely she will miss them. But one thing she will always have is the fond memories of the out-of-time children that chose her backyard as their playground. (laughs) 
the world around us is not as it appears to be. In fact, far from it. As we go about our daily business, working and living our lives, behind the scenes something dark and dangerous is taking place, and it has been going on since the dawn of civilization. Most people remain oblivious to the truth and don't even realize it. Now and again, however, someone will stumble upon the startling reality that, potentially, affects and dictates the lives of just about all of us. What am I talking about? Nothing less than a monstrous collection of supernatural entities that terrify and torment us, and have done so for millennia. They do far more than that, however. They feed upon us. Like bloated, paranormal leeches, they suck us dry as they seek to fuel themselves with our psychic energy, high states of emotion, sexual energy, and the human life force. They hate and despise us, but paradoxically they cannot live without us. Have you ever woken up drained and utterly exhausted from a terrifying nightmare that didn't seem like just another regular bad dream? If the answer is yes, then you may have been fed upon by these infernal things. When we sleep, we are at our most vulnerable, and that's exactly how they want us. A dream is not always a dream, as strange as that might sound. Sometimes it is an indication that as you sleep and as your guard is down, these voraciously hungry monsters are, in essence, eating you. Among these creatures are the shadow people, hostile things that typically manifest between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. and who have the ability to paralyze us and drain our bodies of energy in much the same way that the vampires of folklore would drain people of blood. In fact, such distorted tales of vampirism almost certainly had their origins in the worlds and actions of these multidimensional beings. In a paper he prepared years ago, Jason Offit wrote, in part, Like the men in black, the hat man has floated in the periphery of our lives for decades, observing our movements, occasionally interacting with us, but always threatening. Charles was 13 years old in 1949 and lived with his mother, brother, and grandmother in San Jose, California, when the hat man crept into his life. He lay in bed with his brother, talking before they drifted off to sleep when the window sash moved. A dark figure dressed in a black cloak and wearing a black hat with a wide brim appeared in the window, Charles said. No facial features were discernible on this person, but I took it to be a man. This hat man opened the window and reached through with both hands. I thought he was going to climb in, Charles said. At that moment, I started yelling my head off. As Charles's young voice pierced the night, the hat man closed the window, turned, and disappeared from sight. The next morning, Charles saw the window was locked from the inside. I saw something, Charles said. What in the hell was it? Equally dangerous are what can accurately be termed supernatural seducers. Dangerous entities that thrive on sexual energy are also part of the equation. A highly charged sexual dream may be deliberately initiated by such things, which over the centuries have been referred to as Incubus, Succubus, Lilith, and the Old Hag. Also relevant to this angle is the reason why so many supernatural encounters occur at so-called Lover's Lane locations. In these cases, voyeurism and sexual emotion led to feeding. Indeed, at such Lover's Lanes, we can find numerous encounters with the likes of Bigfoot, Mothman, Goatmen, and even aliens. Poltergeists, violent entities that can cause chaos in the home and who delight in tormenting us much as they are energized by us, are also part of the equation, as are thought forms and tulpas, creatures created within the human mind and the depth of our imaginations but which can be externalized and given a strange form of life in the real world. Key to the survival of tulpas and thought forms is that we believe in them. The stronger our belief, the greater the ability of the tulpas to live. In other words, they feed on and coldly and carefully nurture 
our belief systems. Then there is the Slender Man, a sinister figure which started out as an internet experiment, but which has mutated drastically in the last few years to the extent that numerous people report having seen the Slender Man in the real world. It's a perfect example of a modern-day tulpa, thought form running wild in our reality. Witnesses describe seeing the scrawny, black-suited figure looming over their beds in the dead of night, extracting energy, and dining in a fashion that we don't even want to think about. The men in black fall into this category, too. Those who have had UFO encounters and who have been visited by the pale-faced ghouls known as the MIB state that while being threatened and intimidated by men in black, they have felt cold, clammy, weak, and lightheaded. As many of the unfortunate witnesses have stated, it's as if the MIB are draining them in the same way that a flashlight drains a battery. And using the same analogy, when the light finally goes out, we do too. To slightly alter the words of Charles Fort, the stark and terrifying truth is that our planet may well be one big farm, and for these energy-based entities, we are the cattle. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching and our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. known as one of the most illegal places one could, but really shouldn't, visit, Pavilia Island sits just off the coast of northern Italy near Venice. When most people began planning a trip to that part of the world, images of romantic walkways and Renaissance art come to mind. Haunted islands, on the other hand, generally don't rank very high on anybody's must-see vacation list. But some visitors are still curious about the small, infamous Italian island that once hosted thousands of refugee Black Plague victims, serving as a quarantine island for those who were even suspected of harboring the bacteria. The island remains one of the most haunted places in Italy, and despite the fact that it is illegal to visit Boviglia, thrill-seekers continue to consider it a cool, albeit creepy, destination. However, everyone who has taken the chance of stepping foot on the island has left with absolutely no desire to ever return. The Italian island of Poviglia has a history chock full of tragic events going back thousands of years. During the Roman Empire, the island was used to house victims of the plague in order to protect the rest of the country, forcing inflicted people to live and die in isolation. Then, during the medieval era, when the plague returned and killed off nearly two-thirds of Europe's population, Pavilia was once again called upon to take in the sick and dying. Dead bodies quickly began to overcrowd the island, and thousands were dumped into large, common graves. In many cases, the bodies were burned. Some overly cautious Italian communities even got into the habit of shipping away anyone who showed the slightest signs of illness. Many of those people had not actually been infected with the plague at all and were literally dragged to Bovilia and dumped atop piles of rotting corpses. The terrifying, negative energy that has been left in the wake of these deaths remains, even in the island's very soil. 
Covilla Island still happens to be home to thriving grape vineyards. Nearly the only people who dare visit the island these days are those who go to seasonally harvest the fruit. Grapevines must do well in ashy soil because it's been said that more than 50% of the island's soil is composed of human ash. Yes, over thousands of years that is just how many people have perished and rotted on this nightmarish island. When a mental hospital was opened on Pavilia Island in 1922, few people were very surprised. However, the arrival of droves of mentally disturbed patients to the island only served to enrich the legend of it being a place to avoid. The isolation and privacy offered by the island also allowed for disreputable scientists and doctors to do as they pleased to their patients. Reports of widespread abuse and heinous experiments began to float back to the mainland, bringing with them the screams of the tortured souls trapped there. Pavilia legend tells of a particularly demented doctor who worked at the island's mental hospital in the early 20th century. His notorious experiments on patients are still shocking when told today. For instance, he believed that lobotomies were a great way to treat and cure mental illness, so he performed lobotomies on numerous patients, usually against their will. The procedures were heinously wicked and painful, too. He used hammers, chisels, and drills with no anesthesia or concern for sanitation. He supposedly saved his darkest experiments for special patients, whom he took to the hospital's bell tower. Whatever he did in there, the screams from those being tortured could be heard across the island. Karma eventually caught up with this wicked doctor. According to the story, the doctor began to suffer his own mental torture and was pursued by the island's multitude of ghosts. Eventually, he lost his mind and climbed to the top of the bell tower and flung himself to his death below. There are varying accounts of his death, though. Some say he may actually have been pushed, either by an angry island spirit or by some of his furious patients. Supposedly, a nurse witnessed his fall, claiming that he initially survived but that a ghostly mist overcame his body and choked him to death. Somehow, the mental hospital remained open until 1968. Many believe that hundreds of thousands of tormented souls still remain trapped on Pavilia Island. From the massive influx of plague victims who were forced onto the island to those who were tortured at the mental hospital that was once stationed there, a sense of sorrow and suffering continues to permeate from the island to this day. In fact, it has even been said that you can still hear their screams. Visitors to Bovilia have been forbidden for decades. Of course, that doesn't stop the occasional thrill-seeker from taking a boat over to the island. Some look at it as a dare. Others are genuinely interested in experiencing a bit of the paranormal. However, all who venture there return shaken. One thing visitors report experiencing is the sensation of being watched. Others report being scratched and pushed by invisible forces. Some entities have even been said to push visitors into walls or chase them down corridors. With a history like that of Pavilia Islands, it stands to reason that the spirits of the tortured patients at the mental hospital would join up with the innumerable spirits of plague victims. Visitors to the hospital during its final years of operation, as well as illegal visitors since then, have reported harrowing paranormal experiences inside the buildings and on the grounds. Visitors report seeing shadows on the walls moving along with them as they explore the decaying facility. And the handful of psychics who have been brought to the island claim there's an energy that can only be described as malignant, with the presence of the angry spirits lingering there so deeply frightening psychics and paranormal experts that most of them refuse to ever return. With more than 100,000 plague victims and mental patients buried on the small island, it's no surprise that human bones continue to wash up on its shores. This fact alone is enough to creep out any potential visitor or buyers. Even fishermen steer clear of Pavilia's shallows for fear of picking up human bones in their nets. 
There is another part of the sadistic doctor story that is worth mentioning. The legend says that one way or another he fell to his death from the mental hospital's infamous bell tower. Maybe he fell, or maybe he was pushed. However, some elaborate on the legend and claim that the doctor was seized, still alive, by some of his lobotomized patients and bricked up in the wall of the bell tower. Other versions say that patients placed him in the tower after he was dead. Locals to this day claim that the doctor's spirit is still in the tower and will remain there forever and that on a quiet night, if you're listening closely, you can hear him ring the tower bell. When the mental hospital on Pavilia was finally closed in 1968, the island was sold to a private owner. However, he did not have it for very long before selling it to yet another owner. In both instances, the new owners could not bear to spend time there. The atmosphere was heavy and morbid. Strange sounds, combined with all the hauntings that had been reported, continued to prevail. As a result, the island was left completely abandoned. It has come up for sale again, but the deals continue to fall through. Maybe prospective owners have heard too many frightening tales in advance. Years after Pavilia Island's mental hospital was shut down, a family decided to purchase the island intending to build a private holiday home there. They arrived and got settled in on the first day, excited to begin their new adventure. But that very first night was filled with such horrors that within hours the family fled, never to return. They reported that their daughter's face was nearly ripped off by an angry resident entity. Amid the numerous reports from illegal visitors is the story of a curiosity thrill-seeker who went to Pavilia with a group of friends. Upon entering the abandoned mental hospital, the illegal tourist reported a heavy sense of dread descend around them, followed by a deep voice that warned, leave immediately and do not return. The visitors immediately complied. This story is not my own story, but my aunt's. Recently, I was talking to my aunt about my own experiences I've had with the paranormal when she told me a very interesting story that happened to her in 1988. Her story goes like this. Back in the winter of 1988, my Aunt Melody lived in rural southern Indiana. In the winter, the roads would get really bad and be covered in black ice. One afternoon, my aunt borrowed my grandma's car to take out on a date because the roads were so bad and her car was a four-wheel drive. My aunt left and only a few miles away she came to one of the large hills that you have to take to get anywhere. She turned down the road when suddenly the car went out from her and she found herself losing control and going into a tailspin. When she stopped the car, it was stalled and was stuck in the middle of the road. My aunt was okay but now worried because the car was stuck and not starting and there she was in the middle of the road. If another car was to come up that hill, just then, it would not be able to stop in time and would hit my aunt. My aunt tried again and again to start the car with no luck. While she was there trying to once again move the car, and lights suddenly appeared behind her. It was the headlights of a Jeep. Out of the old Jeep appeared a tall young man in his early twenties with long blonde hair and dressed in sort of a suit. The thing was, she hadn't heard him approach at all and hadn't seen the lights until that second. He would have had to slam his brakes to stop in time not to hit her, and that should have made a noise no matter what. But there was no warning, he just appeared out of nowhere. He approached my aunt, not really ever giving her a name, but offered to help her. My aunt, just wanting to get to safety off the road, let him, but was still skeptical since the car hadn't started for her. He got in the car, and after a minute or so the car started, and the mystery man slowly drove the car to the side of the road just enough for my aunt to get traction so she could move it. He got out of the car and my aunt thanked him, surprised at how quickly he'd moved the car, and thanked him again for helping her out, even if she was a complete stranger. The mystery man said, it was no problem, you would do the same. 
and then went back to his Jeep. My aunt had just got in her car and looked back to see where the mystery man was, but he was gone. He hadn't drove past her, and she didn't even hear his Jeep start up and go back down the hill. He had disappeared, just like he had appeared from nowhere to nowhere. My aunt made it home safely that night and continued to think about the mystery man that had probably saved her life. After she finished her story, I asked her what she believed him to be, and she said to me that she believes him to be her guardian angel. She said that he knew she was in danger and came to her rescue. I accepted that and agreed, but I also brought up the fact that I know that several people have died on the area of that road, so was it possible that she was visited and saved by the spirit of someone who died in that same area and didn't want to see it happen to someone else? Either way, whether he was a guardian angel or a spirit, I'd like to believe he saved my aunt that night. We'd all like to think that people are capable of making positive changes, and many are. In the case of Jack Unterwedger, aka the Vienna Strangler, aka Jack the Writer, this was not the case. Released from prison following a murder conviction, Unterwedger was considered completely rehabilitated from his violent urges of the past. Within a year, however, he would kill 11 more women, many of whom were prostitutes. A global manhunt to catch Unterwedger ensued, culminating in a dramatic standoff with police. Johann Jack Unterwedger's troubled relationship with prostitutes supposedly traces back to an early age. He was born in Graz, Austria in 1950. It was rumored that, in addition to being a barmaid, his mother also worked as a prostitute. She was arrested for fraud and was briefly imprisoned while she was pregnant with Jack. After her subsequent arrest in 1953, Unterwedger was sent to live with his grandparents, as he never learned the identity of his father. During his early childhood, Unterwedger began to commit petty crimes, which soon escalated into assaults of prostitutes in his area. Between the ages of 16 and 25, Unterwedger was convicted of 16 crimes, most of which were sexual assaults. He spent the majority of these years in prison only remaining free for months or even weeks at a time. In 1974, Unterwedger committed his first murder. He killed a German citizen, 18-year-old Margaret Schaefer, by strangling her with her bra. He was convicted for the crime in 1976 and was sentenced to life in prison. When Unterwedger confessed to the 1976 murder, he said that he'd envisioned the victim as his mother, causing an intense rage to come over him. While Unterwedger was in prison, he started writing. He wrote poems, short stories, plays, and eventually a widely successful autobiography called Purgatory. It became a bestseller, leading Austrian citizens to campaign for Unterwedger's release, saying that his writing demonstrated his rehabilitation. Some schools even used his book as required reading. He was released after completing the minimum term for a life sentence in Austria, 15 years. After his release, Unterwedger went on a national tour discussing his books on various television and radio shows. He was a celebrity in Austria. He bought a Ford Mustang and donned designer clothes for his press tour. He became a working journalist and reporter, and he even reported on later murders that he committed. His first post-prison murder was that of Blanca Bakova. Her body was found floating in the Vatava River near Prague, Czech Republic. Her body was found covered in leaves with a set of gray stockings tied around her neck. Friends had seen her the previous night getting drinks. When they left shortly before midnight, they noted that Bakova was talking to a man in his 40s. A few weeks later, a well-known sex worker in Unterwedger's hometown went missing. Her body was found several months later, and she was killed the same way as Bakova. A third woman, Heidi Marie Hammerer, was killed shortly after the others. She was found on her back, also covered in leaves. All three were strangled, either with their bras or stockings. The fourth woman Unterwedger killed was different. She too was a sex worker, 
but Unterweger took a different approach in the days leading up to her killing. He called her parents a few times beforehand, and he taunted them about how their daughter earned her living. Her corpse was found six months later. She, like the three previous victims, was also found with lingerie around her neck. Four more prostitutes who worked in Vienna went missing within one month of each other. They were all strangled with an article of their own clothing. It was clear to the Austrian police now that they were dealing with a dangerous serial killer. August Schenner was 70 years old at the time of the slayings. He was a retired investigator who told the Austrian police that the circumstances of prostitutes' deaths reminded him of a killer he'd caught nearly 20 years earlier. That killer was none other than Jack Unterweger. As police began to close in on him, Unterweger was hired by an Austrian magazine to write an article on crime in Los Angeles that focused on the differences between the Austrian and American perceptions of prostitution. While on his trip to Los Angeles, Unterweger went on ride-alongs with the LAPD and gave them insight on catching killers. While seemingly assisting the LAPD, Unterweger also found the time to kill three more women. Each woman was sexually assaulted with tree branches and strangled with their own bras. He went to Miami with his girlfriend, even as the Austrian police collected evidence to prove that Unterweger was the killer. The pair went to collect wired money from a Western Union bank where the police were waiting nearby to arrest him. Proclaiming his innocence, Unterweger spoke to the Austrian media to try to convince viewers he was not the murderer. But this time, the Austrian people were not in Unterweger's corner. He was extradited to Austria, where he would be tried for 11 homicides. He was found guilty of nine of these murders, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Unterweger only served one night of his prison sentence. He committed suicide the night of his sentencing with a rope he made out of his prison uniform. The knot was the same kind he'd used to kill his victims. Because Unterweger never had the time to appeal his conviction, under Austrian law, he is technically considered to be not guilty, as his verdict was not yet legally binding. The man, known as the Vienna Strangler, eluded capture for years, all while he was right under their noses, on their radios, and in their newspapers. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.